do is make the world a better place. And the leader, Paul Shoemaker, is with us today. Paul, welcome back. Thank you. Um, for those who have did not see the first interview with Paul Shoemaker, you, you probably should go because we're not going to go over the same stuff. But you, one thing for sure, you got a really cool title. Executive Connector, not Director. Of? <laughs> social Venture Partners. Social Venture Partners. What is Social Venture Partners? We are a network of <clears throat> philanthropically minded, civically minded people the one to invest in their community, and we connect those people up with people on the ground making change. And it's all about connecting those people and engaging them directly in the work in the community. We have a belief that money is absolutely necessary and it's also completely insufficient to solving social problems. So it's all about your human capital, your social capital, and how we do that in a connected, engaged way. And through that, we believe that there are answers and there are solutions that are out there and what they need even more than money is they need human capital applied to them. And as you know, in the last um, handful of years, we've also expanded outside of North America. So that network now is not just a North American network, it's a worldwide network. And the genesis of Social Venture Partners was actually in business, wasn't it? So it was a couple business people. The primary one was Paul Raynard. For anybody that can remember using PageMaker software back in the 90s, um, he was the father of desktop publishing. At that time, his idea was in the late 90s, there's going to be a lot of folks with new wealth through technology. Where does that wealth go and how do they sort of like see themselves as stewards of that in the community? So he created SVP back then for a particular set of reasons, which is it's a different context and a different world now, but it was a great fit then and maybe even a better fit now. So Social Venture Partners is as local organizations and then international organization too? Yes. So Paul's idea was about Seattle. He didn't know how good his vision was. <laughs> so a couple of years after we started to hear, we started getting calls from Phoenix and Vancouver and places like that. So for many years, we were a North American organization. We actually had an individual that started one in Tokyo 10 years ago, but that was sort of a, an outpost, if you will. In the last two to three years, this has really caught on, and we're still growing in North America, but we've grown into Japan, Korea, China, Australia, India, and probably pretty soon the UK. What's your background? Uh, business person, uh, very straightforward. Uh, MBA, brand manager at Nestle for five years, startup that failed in two years, came to Microsoft for six years, middle manager there, and in late 1997, I joined SVP as a member, and somewhere in there I had a lunch with Paul in early 1998, and he asked me if I wanted to do this job, and I said yes. Well. So then you, you took your, your business background, took it into Social Venture Partners Seattle, and then before you know it, you're working all around the world. Correct. Maybe not quite before you know it, um, <laughs> but one of the beautiful things about SVP for me is it was able, I was able to take everything that I'd learned and used in fifth, my first 15 years of my career and apply it to this next 15 years of my career. Any nonprofit, whether it's SVP or ones that we work with in the community to try to create change, they're small businesses. They have a different social purpose, but at the end of the day, they've got to run well, they've got to be effective, they've got to be strong, they've got to be sustainable. So a lot of what I learned about running and being a part of businesses applies very much to what I do now. You've got a blog, if you will, called the Shoemaker Spiel. Mm -hmm. That's kind of cool. Thanks. And just recently, you've been traveling. So let's talk about some of your recent travels. Okay. China, yep. for example. Is that a philanthropic place? Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of wealth there. <laughs> and, uh, Did you notice how careful that answer was? <laughs> well, it, the answer is because, at least for me, for us, I think the answer is formative. It's a great experiment. We, are, we have an SVP in Beijing and in Seoul and in Tokyo. And so you asked me about China, and we, the answer to your question, I believe, is yes. I just can't know that for sure. There, I will tell you this. There's a lot of philanthropically, civically-minded people there, for sure. And our vision is about being in many more places than just Beijing. And I think the opportunity, if we can even in some small way influence or have a push on where some of that wealth being created goes, mm -hmm. there's really a powerful opportunity there. Gates Foundation cares about it. Lots of other folks are paying attention to what's going on in China. But the context for it is so different, just so unbelievably different. So what well, help us understand, what does philanthropy look like in China? What does social venture partners look like in yeah. China? So the context is different. The society obviously is different. There is not much of a philanthropic tradition. In China, literally, 
there is not any tax benefit whatsoever to giving. In Japan and Korea, there's some tax benefit. Mm -hmm. The sort of what they call donation culture is so formative. I will say this, and yet with all of that, if you talk to somebody about why do you want to give back, or why do you want to be a part of something like SVP, the answers become incredibly universal. I could be in Dallas, and I could be in Beijing, or I could be in Bangalore. And that human expression of why I want to give back and why I want to make a difference is very common and very universal. But how it plays out in different parts of the world is going to be very different. It just has to be. Um, so in China, there is a government that's different than the American government. Mm -hmm. And there is an NGO sector that is formative. And there's a philanthropic sector that's even more sort of formative and at its earliest stages. So it's so much more wide open. And yet the need and the opportunity of will is also so much more wide open. It's so formative. We're going to see where, how it turns out. An interesting thing in listening to what you say, though, is that there are people there who are just like the people in Dallas and just like the people in Bangalore. What is it that they're like? Is it that just that they want to make the world a better place, or, or what is it? I think everybody, so there's no question that people are different around the world. That would be stupid of me to ignore that. And yet underneath that, sort of at a, at a gut level, at a heart level, if you will, I think, maybe not everybody, but an awful lot of people have the desire to want to help their fellow person. Mm -hmm. They see need around them. If they are in some way in a better place in life than other people around them are, and particularly if they recognize that that was a function of just where they happen to be born or they happen to be in the right place at the right time in their life, and they want to bring their fellow person along with them. So I think that when you look out across your community, whether it's Beijing or Boston or Bangalore, and you see need, and you see people that are not as fortunate as you are, um, there's, a, there's an incredibly visceral, <clears throat> um, emotional thing that doesn't, I don't think it matters that much what your ethnicity is or what mm -hmm. part of the world that you live in. And I think in some ways the fact that we are in many parts of the world has tapped into that sort of common vein, if you will, amongst people. And also the desire not just to help people, but to want to help people together. Because that's so much of what we're about is we're a network. And that idea seems so obvious in the States. But in other parts of the world, I think there's also very much a desire not just to help on my own, mm -hmm. but how do I do it with other people? Because I'm going to learn from them. I'm going to work together with them. And I can make the whole grain the sum of its parts. So it sounds like that what you're saying is that people don't want to just throw money at a nonprofit and say, you go fix the problem. Here's some money to help. Instead, there is more of an intellectual engagement as well. No question. If you, in the same way that a startup business or a, an emerging business needs more than money, the same is true of a nonprofit. They need human capital, social capital, intellectual capital. They need networks of people to support them and to work with them. Money is always, I said this earlier, it's necessary, it's not sufficient. Mm -hmm. I think money follows good ideas. It doesn't create the good ideas. So you need great ideas and great people out there that are already doing the work and money will sort of come after them. The reason it comes after them is because people create a vision, they build strong organizations, they create a place and a space that people want to invest in what they're doing. So that's the part beyond the money that we think is so important. You also were in South Korea. Yep. South Korea is significantly different from China in terms of its philanthropic SVP approach. Yeah. Uh, so the SVP model, it's definitely adapted, <laughs> but at its core, some of the things we've talked about here today, it would be, you would see the same things in every one of those places. So the kinds of organizations they invest in, their social sector, those things are definitely different and they have to adjust and adapt to that. But at the level that you and I've talked about it, it's pretty common across those cities. Going from Japan to Korea to China is just it's fascinating. So first of all, I'd never been there before. So being three or four days in each place means I probably know sort of enough to be dangerous. But Korea is this really interesting, right between the two of them, geographically and sort of, you know, philosophically, a lot of sort of openness. I think there's an entrepreneurial spirit in that country. Mm -hmm. It's not quite so huge, so there's a little more of a, of a, of a sort of a community feel to it. Um, the mayor of Seoul, who we spent an hour with, is a fascinating, unique individual, often goes on to be the president of the country. That's a place where you go and you feel a real sense of innovation, entrepreneurship, and opportunity, and sort of this emergent culture 
that really, really cares about the social sector and cares about community in a way that they didn't at all 10, maybe 20 years ago. Hmm. Why do you think that change has happened? Wow. <clears throat> I, I would have to be sort of like a Korean historian. I, I just, I know where they, I can remember where I, the stories of what I heard about Korea when I was growing up and I was young and how much different it is now. All, every one of those countries, especially, you know, China, Korea, they are so different than the way they were 20, 30 years ago. And, you know, each of them has evolved in sort of different ways. Um, Korea is, it's always a function of people, too. I think they've probably had a few pretty visionary leaders. Again, this individual that's the, um, the mayor of Seoul sort of came out of the social sector, so he's got mm -hmm. that mindset with him. And yet, when we sat and talked with him in his office one day, he said, I know there are solutions out there to social problems, but I'm not the source of those solutions. They're out there somewhere else, and I'm going to go find them and support them. And usually what you see a public sector official want to say is, I have the answer, I am the answer. Mm -hmm. And this guy was sort of visionary and forthright enough to say, I'm not the answer. I'm going to go find the people out in this, con in this community and this country that do have the answers. What does, you said that the, the current mayor of Seoul came from the social sector. What yeah. does the social sector look like in South Korea? Good question. I would say, actually in all three of those countries, on the sort of, let's, let's say there's the nonprofit side and then there's the philanthropic investment side and you're trying to you know, bring those two parts together. On the nonprofit social entrepreneurship side of the equation, they are in some ways just as developed as what you might find in the States, particularly in reaction to level of poverty and often to natural disasters. That's where the NGO, se NGO sector sometimes gets catalyzed in developing countries. Yeah. So there are, we, in every one of these countries, we sat with people that I had ideas about social change and how to make that change that were just incredibly passionate, very entrepreneurial, really unique, creative, smart ideas. So that side of the sector is really developed. The philanthropic investing side is still catching up. So the donation level per citizen in most of those countries is around 50 to $100 American annually. Oh. So <clears throat> with no ethnocentrism intended, what we have in America is unique. De Tocqueville was right a couple hundred years ago. He's still right, and we're very lucky to have that. There's a level of giving and philanthropy here that's just unique. But the opportunity, I think, is, like I said earlier, is significant in those places. It's just not nearly as advanced. It's not a, as much a part of the culture. They just don't think of it as sort of... Uh, regularly, I think, as Americans do, because we've had that culture, that tradition now for many decades. Yeah. So hopefully we can help to bring that culture along. Do I puff my chest up and say we care more here in America? Is that right? I don't think so. I, I think that it's been a unique part of just the culture and the history of this country. There's no question that creating wealth creates the opportunity for it. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking China 20 years ago, not just because of other reasons, but because of wealth, there just wasn't as much wealth there. Same is true of Korea. So part of it's wealth. And then as time goes on, um, I think a society just evolves to where they start to think more and more about the people that they've left behind or that hasn't been able to come along as much as they have. Same is true in India. We see the same thing there. There's a developing country, you know, a world power, and there are more and more people now that realize that there are haves and have-nots, yeah. and how do we create more equity? Um, Japan, one of the, the yeah. countries that you, you went to, it's, it's a wealthy country. Yeah. A lot of wealthy yep. people there. What's the social problem there? I think that in every one of the, so in any country you go anywhere in the world, there's always poverty, and there are always people that are not as fortunate as other people. So that condition exists no matter what. You know, in a place like Japan, who has been sort of ac economically stagnant for 20 years, I think there's, there is also the question of how do you start to make your economy, make your entire culture move forward again and, and, and get it on an upward slope. So they don't have, for example, we talk a lot about high school graduation. Mm -hmm. That's not really much of a problem there. I'm not saying it's insignificant, but there's so many kids and their educational intensity, if you will, is so strong. Kids are gonna, they're gonna get to high school. They're just going to. So that's not as much of a challenge. I think equity is, <clears throat> I think economic development is, I think workforce development is. So the issues are different in some senses. There's still at the end of the day, something about folks that have been more fortunate than others and how do we create more equity in a society that I think is common no matter where you are. So that sounds like that's one of the, the coming supposedly new millennium development goals 
uh, that's it's going to be talked about, I think, right. by the UN in 2015 or 2016, which is gender equity. Yeah. Um, is that something that Social Venture Partners works for, or do you? I, I guess let's let's get into exactly yeah. what SVP does. Yeah. Your capacity <clears throat> build. So the work that we do in communities. So every one of these 38 cities we're in, in eight countries around the world, they choose their local focus. So they they decide themselves what's the local issue or cause that I want to work on. So uh, I don't know of a city in particular that's working on gender equity, for example, but the, the SVP in Beijing has a greater proportion of women as members, as partners in it than anywhere else in the world. Just fa and I can't even tell you why that is. So in some way, shape, or form, do I think we're helping a little bit with that? I hope we are. It isn't necessarily their explicit focus, but I think that we're helping because there are, there are women in those countries that are leaders and do need opportunities. And if we are one of the places where they have those opportunities, then that's a great thing. But our focus in, in the individual SVPs is finding the entrepreneurs, the social entrepreneurs in those cities and those regions that want to create change and investing in them. There's a, there's a great question on your website. I've got to get to it right now. It says, what happens if you take the potential of every individual connect them directly to the people working on the issues they are passionate about and challenge them to make a difference. I'll ask you. <clears throat> so that's sort of underneath the core of why and how we do what we do. It's a belief, I'll try not to repeat myself, it's a belief that there are solutions out there. And I really do believe that. I've done this now for 15 years. Mm -hmm. And there are, people, there are great schools. And there are people that can lift themselves up out of poverty. And the rate of violent crime and teen pregnancy in America both dropped in half in the last 50 years. So there are solutions out there. It is more about can the right people come together around those solutions? Can those people that have those ideas and communities find the right people to invest in them? So there's very much a sense of potential. And how can you bring together the right set of actors, people, capital, resources, and converge them on a social problem and a social challenge in a way that you can make change happen. And <clears throat> I don't mean that sort of like alchemy, mm -hmm. but there really is a belief that the whole is greater than some of its parts. And that a lot of times what's happened with social change in America is a lot of it happens sort of one off and one at a time. And if we can bring more people together and if we can create more connection between the people that want to invest in the change and create that change and we make them and ha give them the chance to work together, the more will happen. I do. I believe that because I've watched it happen. Well, let's let's talk about some of the things that you've seen happen. Um, because in social venture partners, you're talking about um, people who are probably pretty wealthy, yeah. who are coming to you and, and looking for help to make those connections. Yeah. What are some of the kinds of connections that you can talk about? Yeah. <clears throat> well, so I'll give you a couple. So one is our members are individuals that have some amount of resources, and they're nonprofits in the community that have social change ideas. Mm -hmm. Just think of that just like a small emerging business and a, and a venture capitalist or an investor that wants to you know, find a company to invest in. How do those two find each other? Because you need both sides of the equation. You need the idea, the solution, and you need the resources and the capital. So we do a lot of that kind of connection. Another kind of connection that we do is we take a lot of our members in this community and we get them plugged into organizations. Over time, not all, but some of our partners see the social sector as a next career, as a next stage in their life. Mm -hmm. So Lisa Chin, who's the executive director of Year Up, Peter Bladen, who ran the Grameen Technology Center, uh, Tony Mestres, who's the brand new CEO of the Seattle Foundation, they're all partners. SCP isn't the only thing that got them where they are, but we are part of what helped them build that bridge, and we are part of what connected them to other parts of the community in other ways that they might not have. Um, and I think the last kind of connection that we create is we try to help those nonprofits on the ground, the community, find other people and other resources in, the way, in ways that they otherwise wouldn't have. So when I use this title Executive Connector, it's partly for fun, but it's also partly because I don't direct much of anything. I just connect a lot of things. And I really, truly believe that the right people are out there. And quite often, sort of the, the question and the answer just need to be connected. Mm -hmm. And that's what we try to do is to make those connections. Well, since you're a global organization, can you make connections with somebody in Seattle, for example, who has an interest in Europe or an interest in South Korea? Um, <clears throat> the answer is yes. Uh, I will tell you, not a whole lot yet. I will give you an example. Not a whole lot yet, only because 
in those other parts of the world, they're new emergent organizations. So we need to get them to you know walk before you run. We need to help them get strong before they mm -hmm. can you know sort of deep before they go wide, if you will. Yeah. Um, having said that, in Austin, Texas, and in Bangalore, India, each of them wants to create an incubator. So an incubator in the in the for-profit world is a physical place, a space where new businesses can sort of access resources and access capital in a more condensed way to sort of accelerate and incubate the idea. So that can be applied to the social sector as well. So at the last conference, was it last year or the year before, our international conference, the folks from Austin and Bangalore sort of understood that each of them were working on that. So they are now exchanging ideas together about how do you do this, how do you make this happen. And I don't know that one's ahead of the other. I think they both have sort of different approaches to the idea that fit their country, and yet they're talking to each other about how can we create something in Austin, how can we create something in Bangalore, and what can we learn from each other? If I were to ask this next question 10 years ago, I think the answer would be obvious. I'm not so sure that it is anymore. Is creating jobs an act of philanthropy? Uh, creating jobs is making the world a better place. So it depends how broad your definition is, and mine, mine has certainly broadened over the year. Um, there's no question that it is. I, I would say, the twist that I would put on it is, yes, creating jobs is a good thing. I think what's changed in the last 10 years around jobs and companies is how they think about those jobs. It's not just the jobs they create, but what role do those jobs play in a community? And what is the connection of those jobs to the place where they work and they live? And the sense of corporate social responsibility, which you know, 20 years ago might have sort of been greenwashing today, I think is pretty authentic and it's pretty genuine in a lot of companies. And I think that's a really important, significant thing that's changed in the last 10 years. And just the whole ecosystem of community change is the degree to which the private sector is more and more engaged in this work in an authentic and in a substantial way. Are your members uh, at Social Venture Partners, are they interested in, in creating these incubators where jobs and economic opportunity uh, is present separate and apart from making sure that there's enough food? Right. So in the, in, the other, in the other parts of the world, I would say things like economic development come on the radar faster than they do here. There are more sort of existing institutions and organizations that are doing that work around the states. Mm -hmm. So our focus in North America has been more about things like kids, early, early childhood education, K-12 education, the environment, those issues and those causes that sort of other parts of the community and society haven't addressed as well. That's different than places like you know, China, Korea, India, where those kinds of issues haven't been as dealt with and addressed as directly. So again, that's, an, that's one of those, another, those, another one of those ways in which it's different depending on where you are in the world. So in your time that you've spent so far as Social Venture Partners, what surprised you? Well, I'd say number one, versus the time that I started, I said this earlier, I think that the, the world sort of thinks probably there's not a lot of solutions out there and there's people that don't know how to solve problems. And I absolutely disagree with that. I, almost every big problem or small problem out there, there's somebody that knows how to solve it. That doesn't mean it's scaled up, that doesn't mean it's been sustainable, it doesn't mean it's <clears throat> obviously that we've solved all these things in the world. Certainly. But you can find a great school in every city. There are great schools in this city. We just haven't sort of figured out how to create a great whole school system yet. So that's one thing that surprises me, or I've learned, is how many solutions are out there. Um, I think another thing that I've learned, and I said this earlier too, I think is how sort of common and universal that expression of wanting to give back, of wanting to help your fellow person, how much that really exists in people. I think we can just, in either one of those things I just said, you can get sort of so cynical about the world we live in. There's so much news that's negative or that's fantastical or it's about the latest celebrity and you lose track and lose sight of how many people out there know how to create solutions to problems and how many people want to be not just involved in them but deeply, deeply vested in them and see themselves not just sort of as a person that throws something into the mix to try to help create change but sees, throws themselves into that mix to create change, wants to truly invest themselves, not just their money in that change. So I think both of those sides of it, I've learned so much and seen so much more than I ever would have thought possible 15, even 10 years ago. We have, uh, have interviewed a lot of people who particularly have talked about 
um, the difficulty that women have in, in societies around the world, mm -hmm. uh, certainly here in the United States. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like it is today, yeah. you know, just a few years ago. I'm not saying that it's perfect. Right. Have you seen a growth of the involvement of women at a high level, at a decision-making level, in SVP matters? Mm -hmm. uh, in, in our world, in SVP, the, the gender mix is just about 50-50 everywhere. You might go to one city where it's a little more of one, a little more of the other. Like I said to you, Beijing has, we, were sit, we did their partner meeting a couple weeks ago, their sort of annual meeting, and it hit me. I looked out in the room and I said, wow, there's a lot of women partners in this room, more than mm -hmm. I'd seen anywhere else. So I think in the work of philanthropy, and there's organizations around here like the Washington Women's Foundation, the Women's Funding Alliance, I think the engagement and the connection of women <clears throat> to these causes is just as much as it is for men. And we see in our work women that are at the table just as much as men are in making these decisions and in doing this work. And here's where that question comes okay. from more than anything else. I, I interviewed Gina Torrey of the Peace Research Endowment Fund. Okay. And she gave me a really astounding statistic. And it was essentially that hardly any women had ever been at a peace negotiation table. Hardly ever women ever had been allowed to even sign a peace treaty mm -hmm. before. And you know, you're talking about tackling some of the biggest problems uh, uh, of all through yeah. some of your partners with Social Venture Partners. Um, is there a way for women to actually to get so far um, that they're going to be at the peace negotiation table? <clears throat> that question is probably a little bit bigger than I am. <laughs> I'll tell you what, um, it, that's, that's sort of an amazing uh, statement. I don't know how you can solve any problem without a mix of genders and ethnicities and nationalities at the table. <clears throat> the thought of a bunch of men trying to solve a peace problem, there's something almost oxymoronic about that. Uh, and obvious, huh? Right, right. So, but I will say this. I, I don't know that our, the game we're playing yet is sort of at the peace negotiating table, but I do know the game that we're playing is increasingly about people that came from one background in one sector that can engage with another sector and being at that common table together and how do you create change together to bring ideas and different kinds of people together, we have people that know how to do that. So whether that applies to peace or not, I can't say that, but I work with a whole bunch of people that I think know how to come together at a common table. As we close the show, what's next for SVP? Uh, locally, literally what I just was saying there, more and more how do we be involved in broader community social change ideas, not just sort of one organization, one person at a time. That's sort of the go deep. And then the go broad literally is around the world. The opportunity for this continue to grow in North America but also in other parts of the world is just incredible. We are out over our skis in other parts of the world, but after 15 years that actually feels like a great place to be. Paul, thank you very much for being with us. That's Paul Shoemaker, Social Venture Partners. Be sure to go to the website. We'll see you next time. Take care. Rainmaker believes we can change the world. One life, one heart, one soul, one mind at a time. Rainmaker believes we can change